It's great to see you all. And uh, I thank God every time I stand up here. I, I don't know which I thank God for more, the privilege uh, or really the responsibility as well. Well, I would, I would hazard a guess that most people on the earth spend a lot of their lives being unsure about a great number of things. Uh, their future health, unsure, for instance, of whether they will continue to be employed or whether they will even find any employment. Uh, some are concerned about their spouse's continued faithfulness. Not a problem for me, but uh, uh, certainly listening yesterday to uh, someone who was sharing that in his country, uh, within the first five years of marriage, 50% of the marriages have actually broken up. Well, Bible-believing Christians are, by contrast, known for the things that they are sure of. And what they are sure of isn't just concerned with certain aspects of life on earth, but also with the life to come. In this life, Christians claim to have been forgiven for all their sins, as a result of which they declare that they are sure they will go to heaven when they die. And this assurance is based on the promises of Scripture. I just want to read three very short portions of Scripture, all written by the Apostle John. Uh, it's just a verse in each case, so if you have a Bible and you're very quick at finding references, uh, you can do that, otherwise just listen. The first is from John chapter 17, and it's verse 3. John 17, verse 3. And then after that, we're going to be turning to 1 John 4. So John 17, verse 3, which says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And then if you'd like to turn over to 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 13 to 16. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. We know that we live in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And the final reading is in the next chapter, 1 John chapter 5 and it's verses 11 and 12. I hope you can see the linking between these three readings. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life in is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What I want to do this morning is really draw your attention to the 13th verse of the 4th chapter of John's first epistle, which we've just, just read where it says, we know that we live in him, that is God, and he, that's God, lives in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We know that we live in him, and that he lives in us. Now, it quickly becomes apparent that there are some words and phrases that are constantly repeated in John's epistles. The phrase, we live in him, and he lives in us, is a favourite of John's. In fact, I don't know if you realise, but three times in these short readings, we've had the same or almost identical phrase. God lives in him, and he lives in God. Its significance cannot be uh, totally understood. It is of great significance. But what does the writer mean when he says, that he knows that God lives in him. I mean, this is the most simple language. This is monosyllabic English. 
just about anybody I would think could understand this. He lives in God and God lives in him. Yet, behind this very simple statement is the most important, the most vital, the most profound truth in the whole universe. What do these words tell us? We live in God and he lives in us. Other translations use the word dwell. Uh, One translation, I think, uses the word abide. How can the eternal, omnipotent God possibly live or dwell in a finite, human, mortal being such as you or I? That's the question. It's easy to read the words, but behind it as an enormous question. Surely the idea of the creator of the universe inhabiting a human body is so strange, almost bizarre, so impossible as to be not only beyond understanding, it it, it doesn't make sense. God lives in us. Well, it's very interesting to trace God's dwelling places where he lived and where he dwelt, as recorded in the Bible. In the beginning, in the book of Genesis, we read that God had fellowship with man in a very personal way in the Garden of Eden. He spoke directly with man, with Adam. But man's willful sin broke that fellowship. By the time we get to the next book, the book of Exodus, we read that God lived or or dwelt with or among his people rather than closely in his people. In Exodus 25, God makes a command. He says this, Have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Well, the first of these sanctuaries was the tabernacle that Moses dedicated. And we read there that the glory of the Lord came down and it moved into the tent. So God if you like, dwelt in the camp, but didn't dwell in the bodies of individual Israelites. Sadly, the nation sinned and the glory of the Lord departed. Solomon, however, built a magnificent temple and once it had been dedicated, we're told that the glory of the Lord came to dwell in the land. History repeated itself and when Israel disobeyed God, the nation was taken into captivity. The temple was destroyed and tragically we read that Ezekiel actually saw the glory of the Lord depart. Read Ezekiel 10 sometimes. It's a very sad incident in the life of the whole uh, of the children of Israel. Glory of the Lord departed. It was to be many, many years before the glory of the Lord returned. And when it did return, It came in the form of a tiny baby born in a stable in Bethlehem. The Apostle John records the event in this way. And the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled amongst us and we beheld his glory. So the glory of God came to earth and dwelt in the body of a tiny baby in the body of Jesus Christ. He who was to be the means of our salvation. We read that it's recorded that he went about doing good, healing, preaching and teaching. However, his subsequent trial and unjust just death seemed to be the end. He was crucified. But you, I guess, will know that the cross was not an accident, nor was it actually the will of man. It was God's plan To do what? To restore his presence to his people. The Bible tells us that he not only died, but was raised from death and ascended into heaven. However, before he died, he promised that he would send them a comforter, a paraclete, his Holy Spirit, to dwell in them. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would abide in his people forever. John's Gospel records these words, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter or another counsellor or another helper to be with you forever. I want you to notice the word forever in that verse. 
The Lord Jesus promised that our security in him would be eternal. Not just for the here and now, but forever. Paul later would write to the Colossian believers. He would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's important to understand the word hope in the Bible. It's very different from the word hope which we use today. Our hopes are are generally aspirations uh, that in the future something may or may not happen. I I hope that you will get better, you could say to somebody. They may or may may not get better, but your hope is that they will. Uh, I hope that you will pass your examination. Um, You may or may not, my hope is that you will, but there's no guarantee you will until the results, of course, are published. It's very different in the Bible when we read the word hope. The Bible hope knows no such uncertainty. It is definite. It is fixed. It is permanent. It's not a case of, well, it may or may not happen. The book of Hebrews records this. It says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, firm and secure. It is eternal. There will be no break. So God no longer dwelt with his people, but in his people, and they in him. And that was to be forever. Our security is eternal. It's not temporal, because that is exactly what we've been promised in the Bible. Remember Jesus also said this, he said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Do you see twice, identical phrase in adjoining verses, that same statement, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. You see, if our salvation, your salvation and my salvation, was the result of a decision that we'd made ourselves, or simply the the consequence of, of a response that I had decided to make, there would always be the possibility that it wouldn't last. We are fickle individuals. Our commitment fluctuates from one day to the next depending on our circumstances, our health and any other number of considerations. Added to that, we are weak and we are prone to sin so that if it depended upon us, if it depended upon our behaviour, if it depended upon our feelings, it would, be, it would be unstable. And there would be no absolute guarantee that it would continue. But the Bible says he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And like all the great Christian doctrines, this doctrine of security, eternal security or assurance is from eternity to eternity. It begins with God. And it ends with God. God who is the author, the beginner, and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. You know the old song, don't you? Well, those who are old enough will know it. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. He lives in us, it says in verse 13. It's a statement about a personal relationship. He gains entrance. He comes in when we invite him. And yet, after choosing him, we discover that actually, he first chose us. It's like a doorway. Above it is written, choose. And you go through and you look back and you see the word chosen. He lives in us. He abides. It's present tense. It's it's present continuous. He stays. He continues but only to those who have received him. It can only be known by them. He doesn't make a forced entry. To those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. He lives in us. That means he he continues to impart to us his his liveliness, his his reality, his, his constant presence. Daily we sense he is with us. It doesn't matter what we're doing. 
we know he is there. We don't have to remind ourselves, he reminds us. And our decisions, our desires, our will, everything are touched and affected by his indwelling real presence. But not only does he live in us, we live in him. That means we continue day by day to to, to fellowship with him. And the one acts with and alongside the other. Because he lives in us, we live in him. Simple words. I struggle with English. I struggle with any language to explain this. Incredibly profound truth. But wonderful truth. We live in him, he lives in us. He who has the Son has life. In other words, he who possesses the Son, he who owns the Son of God has life. This isn't just some little clever doctrinal theological statement. It's more than that. And our verse begins with two very important words. The two words are, we know. And if you read John's epistle, you'll know repeatedly throughout the letter, he uses those two words, we know. I counted up, I found it comes 18 times, maybe somebody else would like to count and just check, but 18 times in such a short amount of writing, John says, we know, we know. And those words and the frequent repetition actually is a clue to understanding it. It's a hallmark of John's writing. Twice it appears in this morning's reading. Two very important things John reminds us that we know. He says, we know that we live in him. And he says, we know the love God has for us. And the word know is very significant. We need to be clear about it. There are two ways that you can have knowledge of someone. Either you can know about somebody by by proxy, a sort of second-hand story that you've read about or you've heard about. That's one way you can say you, you know somebody. Or perhaps you should say we know about somebody. Or you can know someone from personal experience because there's been a, a personal encounter, a meeting. I mean, consider these two statements. I know Tony Blair is the Prime Minister of England. I know Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of England. There's only, what, one word difference in that sentence but a whole world of difference in what it means. John writes, this is life eternal, that you, may, they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This morning, I know God. I don't know everything about God, but I know God. And I know he lives, and that he lives in me, and that I live in him. You see, assurance, this, this being sure, this knowing, is one of the greatest facts or truths of biblical Christian faith. It marks Christianity out from Hinduism, from Islam, from Buddhism, from every other great religion, every other worldview, every other ism. But I think we need to ask ourselves... Is assurance the common privilege of believers? Why do I ask that question? Because not all who call themselves Christians would answer that in the affirmative, would say yes. For instance, the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church answers that clearly in the negative. If you refer to their Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 9, not quite bedtime reading, but uh, if you do look at these things, You'll find there a a chapter heading De Justificatione, concerning justification. And you'll read this, this, this statement. I quote, No one can certainly and infallibly know that he has obtained the grace of God. And I do have to say that I've never read or heard anything that the late Pope said as he approached death that indicated he had total confidence and assurance that heaven was to be his final home, based on the work that Christ had done on the cross. So what does this doctrine of assurance that we hold so dear mean? Well, if you look up assurance in the dictionary, it it says freedom from doubt and uncertainty. So assurance, very simply, is a condition 
of being sure. It's not only that you believe that you possess salvation, but you know it from personal experience that not just you possess it, but that it possesses you. And not just that you know what you possess, but you know who possesses you. You're assured of these things. So this isn't just a theological concept, it's a practical matter. And once you're born again, you find you're wonderfully possessed, you're indwelt by the very presence of God. It's a conscious uh, enjoyment of abiding in God's presence and of his work in our lives. And this, this experience grows day by day. I remember the, the day I came to Christ, I was an 18 year old student. And I woke up the next morning and I knew things were going to be different from then on forever. I knew I'd turned a corner and that corner had been turned in a way that would never, the change would be total from that moment onwards. Of course, there's an ongoing growth in our Christian experience, in our experience of God. But we're talking here of an intimate daily relationship. We're embraced by his love. We are forever secure in him. And the result is that we fully know, we're convinced, we're persuaded of this personal reality of the living God. This is what we call assurance. And what we are assured of is our eternal security. But the basis of assurance must never be our own purely subjective feelings. Our feelings can change. They can waver. That doesn't mean we're immune from doubts. It doesn't mean we're immune from uncertainties. We don't have all the answers. There will be trials in our life. There will be delays. But through them, we are able to continue to trust in him. Even when there are things happening around us that we haven't got answers to. That doesn't alter the fact that we live in him and he lives in us. And in fact, that strengthens us through the unanswered questions and the unanswered prayers. You see, true assurance is founded on the word of God. It's not just a doctrine, it's a continuing present experience that is quite unique to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember with OM some years ago, uh, working in France, and I was on a group which was particularly reaching out to Muslim people. And uh, I really hadn't had any experience of this, and I saw a Muslim guy coming down the road and uh, with my heart uh, a little bit trembling, and somewhat in broken French, I, I sought to engage him in conversation. I went up to him, I said, are oh, you a Muslim? Which was an interesting question for a man dressed in the way he was, pretty obvious. Yeah, I am a Muslim. I said, tell me, um, do you pray? He said, sure, yeah, I pray. I said, how often do you say? I pray five times a day. I said, well, that's very good. I said, it's good to hear somebody who is committed to prayer. I said, can I ask you, what do you pray about five times a day? He said, well, um, I, uh, I pray for the planet for, for the sort of created world that uh, we will act and treat it in a responsible fashion. I said, very good. I said, I wish more people had that regard and respect for creation. I said, what else do you pray about? He said, well, he said, um, I pray for my family, that they will be kept safe. I said, very good. It's good to meet a husband, a father who has a sense of responsibility. What else do you pray about? And by now he was beginning to run out of answers to my questions so I thought I'd prompt him. I said, excuse me, I said, when you pray, do you ask for forgiveness for your sins? And he looked a bit sort of uh, ashamed. He hadn't mentioned it. Oh, yes, yes, of course. He said, every time. He said, every time I pray, I always ask that my sins will be forgiven. I said, well, that's, that's very good. I said, can I ask you a question? When you've asked for forgiveness, do you know you are forgiven? He said, oh, no. He said, nobody can be absolutely sure they're forgiven of their sins. We, we hope, we, we trust in the mercy and compassion of Allah, but we, we cannot know forgiveness. That was my chance, wasn't it? I said, well, I know I'm forgiven. I said, because of what Jesus has done, I know I have forgiveness in my life. And I said, you can know that forgiveness as well. And I had a little uh, 
a leaflet with some radio program broadcasts in his language and I handed it to him. I said, you tune in there. I said, you'll hear more about how you can know forgiveness. This is the unique, the unique experience of the Christian. Nobody else goes around saying they know they are forgiven. doesn't mean we are perfect. Of course, we still continue in sin, to sin, but we can know forgiveness. We can know his power. We can know his cleansing. This is unknown to everybody else. The confidence of our faith is based not on works of righteousness that we have done, but on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as we were singing, and I didn't know we were going to have this song, I've written here, we can have boldness to enter by the blood of Jesus. The eternal security of a genuine believer is entirely due to God's work and faithfulness. Not to anything we've done, any deed or any merit. It's a glad sense of security, of freedom, of eternal life in him. Isn't it wonderful at night? You can put your head on the pillow and know that you are at peace with God. And when I say to people, I know I'm going to heaven, it's not some arrogant, proud admission because I've done something or I've obeyed a certain set of rules. I don't say I know I'm going to heaven because it's a reward for something I've achieved by my own efforts. It's not because I'm basically righteous in myself. Not at all. It's a statement based on the promises of Scripture that tell me what Christ has done for me. And it's only because of what Jesus has done that I have this assurance that I know I'm going to heaven. After I became a Christian, remember my sister turned to me one day. She said, Gareth, there's something different about you. And I, I had no idea what she was talking about. So what do you mean? She said, she said, you have a sureness about your life. You have convictions now that you never had before. She saw something had happened. That God had done something in my life. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Can I ask you this morning, because I don't know everybody here, do you have this assurance this morning? Do you, can you say this morning, I know God? I'm not asking you, can you say, I know about God? Can you say, I know God? You may be saying, well, how can I know him? How, how can I have this assurance? How can I have this salvation? The Bible is quite clear that it cannot be earned. It's not a reward that you receive because of something that you've done. It's only something that God can give you if you ask. Assurance will only spring from a heart that is conscious of the indwelling presence of Christ. And we need to invite him to indwell us, to receive his salvation. I always remember, actually, it was in, it was in South Africa. I was speaking uh, in one of the universities, I can't remember which, uh, and some of the staff of that university was there. And a, a guy came up to me afterwards to talk to me, and he said, uh, he said, I'm interested in what you said this morning, he said, because I want you to know that for, for many years, I was active in serving God without knowing him. He told me he was the, the leader of the Sunday school. He even led the prayer meeting. But he had no assurance. I was amazed that he could have done all that and not have any assurance. I then said, well, how did you become sure? He said it was through reading the word. He encouraged me to go on speaking about assurance. Because many people in the church go to church, but don't actually have the assurance that the Bible promises and until we have received him, we are not controlled by the Spirit of God, but by our own selfish, sinful desires, which are set in opposition to God. So come to him today. Come to him in repentance. Come confessing your sins. Come seeking his cleansing. And only then will you be able to say with the Apostle John and with the rest of us, we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Let's pray. Father, 
We thank you for these simple and yet utterly profound words. A struggle even I find to, to, to explain it and yet the transforming truth of the salvation of Jesus Christ. May we all leave this place this morning sure of what you've done in our life, sure of your indwelling presence, that we might glorify you and serve you the rest of our days. And then, on that great day, find ourselves in eternity worshipping you with the company of believers from around the world. We ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, I guess there's only one hymn. Well, I said there's only one hymn. There's a particular.